Hi, my name is Morgan Ogilvy, and I received my MFA in the art program in 2020, and I recently joined the CalArts Alumnix Council. Tonight was the third screening of our final part of our postgrad show, Time is Out of Joint, including work from a total of 29 art, photo, and art and tech grads. I'm excited to introduce highlights from the first two parts of this show in case you missed them. You may visit our website at timeisoutofjoint.com for more information and to view the full exhibit, which also includes a physical show at the Mackey Apartments and a publication of 40 boxed editions of original artwork. This show was organized by Scott Benzel and participating artists. The identity design was created by Ella Gold. The website development was created by Julian Stein and the website design was created by Julian Stein and Hannah Rubin. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy these highlights. Hi there, my name is Tom Lawson. I'm the Dean of the Art School at CalArts and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to um, Time is Out of Joint, the MFA post-graduation show. And um, I'm here with Colleen Smith, who is uh, on the faculty and we're doing this little hosting thing together. Um, it's been a, you know, of course, this has been a very difficult period for everybody and sort of difficult to be an artist and figure out how to present work. And I'm really actually very proud and excited to see um, how this group of young artists have come together to do something really interesting about that, uh, that problem. I remember meeting with them back in January when, in the time before, when everything seemed normal. And we were talking about this show and we were discussing what kind of space and sort of more or less the downtown part of Los Angeles we would be doing it in. And it was a, going to be a fairly conventional kind of thing. Um, you know, by May, it was clear that that was not going to be the case and we had to begin thinking otherwise. And they really put their minds to it in this really fabulous way, I think. Um, what what we have here is this sort of concatenation of threes. Um, there are three platforms. Um, there's an internet section of the show, um, which will, that platform will contain all the information about everything in some ways. Um, but there's also a physical show at the Mackey Apartments um, in Mid-City, Los Angeles. And so there's a, an, a, an ability to see work um, in three dimensions. And then at the end of the project, there will be a, a collection of small editions uh, in a box that will be available. Um, and that, I think, nicely shows support for the United States Postal Service um, at a time when they're under threat. And then there's another um, three-part element to this, which is that the show itself is divided into three, uh, three sections. There are 30 artists in the entire show and they're, um, they're showing together in groups of 10. And so we're here this evening to celebrate that first group. Um, and it's a combination again of, as I said, it's this physical work in the space and there's also video. And in some instances, there's an interconnectivity between that, uh, those two parts. So there's a video that leads into a physicality and vice versa. So it's a really, I, I think it's a super interesting project all around. And um, I think Colleen maybe can tell us who's involved. Hi everyone, I'm Colleen Smith. I'm faculty at CalArts. It's my pleasure to be here with Tom um, to introduce the first of three programs um, in one of the three platforms that our MFA graduates have found a way to put together. I actually, I think it's kind of amazing that um, these solutions are being found and that it's dynamic and it's interesting and it's something that I would have been delighted to experience even before the pandemic. And it's a very generous way of making things happen 
now. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to the artists that will be in the first show. Alia Ali, Ginny Aum, Tracy Yu Feng, Sterling Hedges, Stephanie Mei Huang, Vin Hai Keo, Morgan Ogilvy, Hannah Rubin, Lillian, Yang, Liang, Lillian Li Yuan Yang, Evelyn Hang Ying. Uh, congratulations, you guys, and I can't wait to see the work. That was great, and I'd like to toast you all with my, my <laughs> beard here, <laughs> since we're supposed to be at an opening. <laughs> two and a half weeks since the WHO labeled COVID-19 a pandemic and since I have been sheltering in place. My parents started sheltering in place since January 28, 2020. They lived in Shanghai, China, where I spent the majority of my life. Two days ago, China closed its border to foreign nationals. For my Chinese American family, this meant that neither my brother, who lives in D.C., nor I could return to Shanghai, and my parents would not be able to return home if they left. All three of them would have been here 
this weekend. I feel temporally scrambled in many ways and time feels syrupy, not necessarily, in that it is moving slowly or quickly, but in that it is no longer demarcated or punctuated by public life or bureaucratic impositions of labor. And one day slides into and dilutes the next and weeks feel that way too and so on. I have been ideologically accustomed to my parents living 15 hours in the future. Yet, it is bizarre to feel that now they are experiencing events a month and a half in the future. But also, time moves at a different pace under a communist regime instead of a democracy. I notice that she commends increased measures of mass surveillance accustomed to an entire life of the private being colonized by the public. Today, she says on the phone, I think from now on, the rest of the world will no longer be so judgmental towards China. I don't have the heart to tell her of the increasing anti-Chinese sentiment here. Her greatest global political concern seems to lie in how China is perceived as a nation state by the West rather than how the Chinese are perceived racially. I notice how she cannot see that this is a byproduct of American exceptionalism or a byproduct of Chinese propaganda, how she seems more sensitized to the effects of exceptionalism rather than actual exceptional byproducts, whereas I am more sensitized to those byproducts, which I tend to think of as erasure and displacement. My parents, having spent 20 years on the East Coast and later in the Midwest, have this specific relationship to internalized racism that I was never able to understand. It is the kind of first generation immigrant meets boomer mentality that suggests to them that they have never experienced any form of racism, not when they served at the China Pavilion in New York, nor the House of Fortune in Manhattan, nor the Lotus on Long Island. Not when we lived in Sycamore Hills in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and my mother hung out with all these white moms with long, glossy, blonde bobs and taught them how to cook Kung Pao chicken for all their adopted Asian babies. I, of course, hung out with all these other Asian babies, but was the only one with a real Asian mother. There is this repeating scene I relive an addition of my father walking into an elevator. If there is a white man in the elevator, there is this affective way that he presents himself in code switches. He is more likely to say, hey, how are you doing? Or good morning, with a nod. In this way, that seems to be the best rendition of the Midwestern masculine chronotope in his eyes slightly gruff, but mostly warm. A week and a half ago, after a slew of anti-Chinese rhetoric from politicians, in which Trump began calling COVID-19 a Chinese virus in an attempt to scapegoat, and Senator John Cornyn claimed China was to blame because of a culture where people eat bats and snakes and dogs, and things like that. And Republican county head in Kansas Marvin Rodriguez suggested Kansas wouldn't be hit hard at all because they don't necessarily have any Chinese people. My dad called and asked if I would be leaving the apartment alone and perhaps it was not safe to. It's the first time in my life that he has expressed concern regarding my race. He has always thought that being born in this little town in Wausau, Wisconsin, and my subsequent US citizenship meant that I would not experience acute racism in this country. But the Chinese have repeatedly been a scapegoat in this country, American citizenhood or not. Not dissimilar to my parents' inability to see racism unless the President of the United States is spewing explicit anti-Chinese sentiment. My own racial grief came to me as a delayed latent trickle, sort of like the dregs of an upside down honey jar slow to crystallize liquid sediment. I lived in far west Texas for three years before I came to Los Angeles, unable to fully articulate what it was that drew me towards cowboy culture. In November and December,
December, I was unable to make any visual work, instead moving through writing a paper, the first half of which traces the trajectory of the affective lineage of the Chinese body in the American West upon examining biopolitical governmentality. The U.S. has adopted an affective geopolitics that works to actively construct objects of threat. Louisa Moore terms a politics of possibility in which post 9-11 risk management of low probability, high consequence events within the contemporary neoliberal West defines state governance, both domestic and internationally. She also argues that the performance of risk management itself produces the effects it names. Post-September 11 terrorist attacks saw the transformation of the affect of the brown body that appears Middle Eastern, Arab, or Muslim. The nation state produced a new type of threat to preserve the national security of the white world and as a result, a new type of racialized affect for that brown body. Affect in the form of fear anticipates future threats, but also creates the threat that triggers this anticipation of fear. Ultimately, identity is assumed to be anchored as a source of prediction and prevention. Two months ago, the first COVID-19 related travel ban in the U.S. stated that foreign nationals from China were prohibited from entering the U.S. as a prevention measure. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first immigration law that excluded an entire ethnic group, was put into place. In 2018, a federal law that restricted visas for Chinese graduate students on the basis of foreign students being seen as espionage, risk for the American intelligence community. FBI Director Christopher A. Ray noted, one of the things we're trying to do is view the China threat as not just a whole of government threat, but a whole of society threat on their end, and I think it's going to take a whole of society response by us. The U.S. subsequently names the threat of fear as stemming from the Chinese body, reinforcing a biometric border. The non-effective fear of a mob of Chinese bodies finds its roots in 19th century tropes of yellow peril xenophobic anti-Chinese rhetoric justified by the perceived unassimilable nature of the Chinese people, their placelessness within the manifest destiny discourse and the economic competition that they provided through cheap labor and poor working conditions. A term that first came into popular usage in regards to Chinese bodies preceding the Exclusion Act Yellow peril was a method of political scapegoating that followed the economic recession of the early 1870s. The peril was amplified by the development of anti-immigrant discourses, a bacteriological racism that assumed Chinese immigrants carried Asiatic diseases that threatened the vigor of imperial power powers and were racial poisons. The dehumanizing comparison of the Chinese to pathological hosts of disease served as a metaphorical vehicle to imagine the yellow body as a parasitic, invasive colony contaminating whiteness. In considering bacteriological rhetoric and germ theory, affective fear exponentially rises in contemplating the singular bacteria cell as opposed to a bacteria colony. Other renderings and illustrations that contributed to yellow peril used animalizing rhetoric as a method of objectifying and simianizing. It is important to note that the affect of yellow peril and fear and the affect of the model minority are both rooted in notions of labor. While the affect of fear of a Chinese invasion stemmed from a growing Chinese immigrant labor force that posed a potential threat of displacing white labor opportunities, the affect of the model minority is founded upon characteristics of the labor of hard work and diligence. The Chinese body's evasion of being perceived affectively as threateningly part of a larger invasive labor force by laboriously performing even more labor to redeem itself reveals the precariously thin line the Chinese body teeters upon, a line that draws an arbitrary
arbitrary distinction between an affect of exclusion as opposed to an affect of assimilation, relegated to a spectrum of labor that oscillates between threat and non-threat, malicious and benign. The Chinese body with the United States endlessly performs servitude in reinforcing American identity through its own peripherality. كانت آخر نقطة شفتها من اليمن أضواء بعد أنا ودعت طفولتي ودعت كل ودعتها بهذاك الضوء الأخير إلى المجهول أول خطوة خطوتها من خارج السفينة دخلت غربة طويلة جدا الروح عرفت ان هذه نقطة كلا عودة خطوة المجهول كلانا رحن ليمن السعيد معروف لأرض جن كملان شامية لمن قارمرة ووكن معين لثوب لملحنم لبن قهوة لوعلس لرب خور لمر مفتارة بلسن مراح مهم تعكرن كرامة شت أختمي في الدنيا راح مغر أقوية سمتهن ملقا بالقيس أنشحنت من قلم السبع ذو حب الشمس كما أن ذو حب القمر ذو جنبك ها راح أن خيت ستارة ذو خيت مك أتوية ذو مك شبع كان بنيعان 
والقروح اثنين ذو لكين خوف العليم بق ايش من ورته فلذقو شموي عن عن انتقرا بيا رؤرؤ وصوف وجرا ذو ملكن بالقيس عصفورنج بالسلاقلو والسلاقلو كل واجواب قولا عصفور انجذو كل مقا الفرعون ذا البلد بعديد وبرقه سلم قاره ملك غنم برق سقره ولجارو مكر باقرو ذوب بلقيس النجم الاحمر ونر نمذو والنهر بني سبا تلداد الحرقان
اخر نقطة من اليمن شفتها في جهاز الملاحة تبع كان الوقت لي طلعنا من الميناء اليمني ما يقارب الساعة سبعة ونص في الليل كانت آخر نقطة شفتها من اليمن أضواء الميناء بعد ما يقارب عشرين دقيقة كأنه أنا ودعت طفولتي ودعت كل شيء ودعت أربعة وعشرين سنة في اليمن ودعتها برأيي ودعتها بهذاك الضوء الأخير ايضا اخر نقطة عرفت ان انا كنت فيها في اليمن من جهاز الملاحة اللي كان على السفينة اللي سافرت فيها فعبرت من حياة الى المجهول اول خطوة خطوتها من خارج السفينة للارض دخلت غربة طويلة, طويلة جدا جدا الروح عرفت ان هذه نقطة اللعب Arabia Felix, happy Arabia. It's known for being the land of plentiful in architecture, jewelry, textiles, salt, coffee, honey, frankincense, myrrh. Given its geographic location, it's significant. My best friend was the most powerful woman in the world. Her name was Belqis. She ruled the land of Sheba. She loved the sun just like I love the moon. We kept each other company. While I weaved my webs, she wove her poetry. She was smart and she was powerful. And for those two reasons, she was feared. She was also very beautiful, but she knew that beauty was a trap because beauty, she would say, expires. Knowledge never does. One day, a hoopoe bird comes to her kingdom and asks Queen Belqis many, many questions all of which she has the answers to. The hoopoe bird tells her that a king from a distant land heard rumors of her and would like to visit her. She agrees, under the one condition that he brings her a gift that he sees would match her power. Time passes and the king arrives to her kingdom. And to match her power, he gives her the red star. She accepts this gift, and from this day forward, the children of Saba would suffer the consequences of having their land fall into the hands of others, and others, and more others. Hi, my name is Shirley Tse. I am faculty in the art program at CalArts. It's my pleasure to co-host the second part of Time is Our Joint Exhibition by the MFA student with Charles Gaines here. The exhibition is in three um, 
platform as well. So the digital, which is the website, it contains a lot of information, but it's also physical at the Mackey apartment in Los Angeles. And for those of you who would like to visit, please make an appointment. And it also uh, exists in the form of, uh, of addition in a box that's gonna be sent through the postal services. It's a way to support the United States Postal Services. The following artists are featured at the Mackey apartment. They are Wu He Cho, Sophia Dao, Namas Atias, Michelle Sauer, Holly Harrow, Aaron Kapoor, Clara, Clara Chambles, Casey Baden, Asu Guerra, and Andrew Seidenberg. Pleasure to be here. I was very delighted to, to get the invitation to host part of the project, even though I think there's, there's something wrong with all of you for inviting me, but I can, I can uh, do my best. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is to, uh, to, is to just sort of introduce the artists who are live streaming uh, their videos in, in a video presentation part of the show.
uh, and, and, and those people are. Uh, and I, I presume that you'll see the video in the order that I'm giving. Uh, but the, the first one is Andrew Seidenberg's video, uh, Sun Valley 2020, which uh, you know, makes me think twice about taking the train. And Holly Harrell, the Victorian mourner, a, a, a very, very you know, compelling and sort of meandering narrative that I thought was very interesting. Wu He Cho, this, this, this introspective, quite introspective piece that is full of kind of pop or, uh, or a sort of, um, I don't know how to describe it, quick exotic references. And uh, Nama Adis, uh, oh, I should say that uh, Wu's piece is titled Singular, also done in 2020. Now, Nama I just, uh, this piece is titled To the 7th Year Old I Once, excuse me, To the 17 Year Old I Once Was, which also makes me glad that I'm not 17. And uh, finally, Aaron Kapoor's uh, study and, and Grammy winning performance in Turn Me Loose. So I hope you enjoy these pieces as much as I did. I did. Um, the video streaming is going to follow immediately after our introduction. So you have to stay here and watch them. And as well as the um, exhibition at the Mackey apartment, I, I think it's just like beam with energy. There is sculpture, sculpture installation, painting, painting installation, performances, object that um, were used in the performances was shown and time-based work, and, uh, and there's indoor, outdoor, and uh, I, go see it. <laughs> yeah, and I also I would, uh, would like to c uh, comment at, at that. Uh, I was very impressed when I found out about this idea of exhibition. I, I think it's marvelous, I think it's in ingenious, it's taking, uh, advantage or not being hindered by the incredible set of circumstances that we are going through now. Uh, I, I really commend the organizers and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the and the class for coming up with this with this uh, means of means of presentation. Good for you. Three cheers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Likewise. And here's, oh yes. Here's you. I, I got my beer, and I'm going to toast. I got wine. Go, Congratulations! Uh, there you go. Now, as you can see, we have four mounds. And before we excavate the bodies, which there are plenty, we're going to examine the architecture of the place itself. The north mound here, as you can very well see, 90 to 120 feet high. South mound, 80 to like 70 feet high. Is this east or is this west? 
Probably yeast. 30 million tons of waste among all of these mounds. What you have here is like a whole lot of dirt mixed in with human remains, mixed in with cans, mixed in, mixed in with bags, mixed in all appliances, from washing machines to dryers to toasters, styrofoam to aluminum, because you know recycling is probably one of the most ghostly of the things that we're gonna talk about. You know, I don't know, have you ever actually seen a recycling plant? I haven't, myself. They put the recycling out, but no one actually has ever seen where they take the stuff. It's rumored that there are recycling plants maybe on an, some island far away, in the outskirts of a city, but there aren't even human beings on the outskirt of a city, to my knowledge. I mean, there's trash everywhere. Starting soon. We're starting. We're starting in about 20 minutes, so take your break. There's a restroom over here. Right to my left, there's a, a restroom there in that elongated sort of tower. And I know it's eerie, but it's just part of the package deal you get with a, a tour like this. And, you know, refreshments are over there. There's some water to, you know, nourish yourself. Don't get dehydrated. It's very hot out and the fumes coming off of the junk and dump, it doesn't smell great. It's not good and it's toxic and we could die before this is over. There's so much to get to, but before we do that, I just want to take a moment to recognize the odor that you might you might be smelling coming from this area. Now, I think what you'd expect more or less is something toxic, like a, a mixture of chlorine and urine. Really, an islander's day is all about the direction of the wind. It's not, it doesn't smell good and they try and mask that smell with pine and lemon but it, it actually just adds to the smell and makes something rather so disgusting it's like a funeral parlor kind of covered in urine just one minute Jeez. jesus christ they're on me with all these questions today can they see me i'm going to demonstrate today a process that's really quite simple i mean you know, thousands of men have tirelessly done this as their career, as their chosen career or their, well, maybe not chosen, but no option but career. I mean, we're about, let's see, we're about like 125 feet in the air. You can see me right now from the moon. This landfill is surrounded by the Great Kills estuary and that water is about 70% corn syrup, as are most people here. I, myself, and everyone else in the surrounding areas are about 70% corn syrup. South Mound is a site where some of the most bitter of souls roam the land. Uh, it's the burial site of the sanitation department. Did you hear that? I think that was, I think that was the bitter soul of Marty Belly because as I was about to say, Marty Bellew took what he thought was a temporary job as all things started off in this dump. Everything started off as temporary and turned into a lifetime of servitude. Chills. You see the hair on my arms. And it's said that his ghost is especially volatile in this area, as well as his wife. His wife was rumored to have chased him around the kitchen many a time with a broomstick and a paddle with his name carved into it. It said that he could walk on water and it said that he wanted to get as high to the sky as possible like Jesus and God. Now someone in 1930 was a bit smaller than a human nowadays so we're going to try and guess how big his body was. This feels about the right proportions to maybe where he, his stomach was. But let's say this is his head. And these are his arms. This is probably the rope. This is his belly, more or less. And then how about his feet? Yeah, over there. Go past that, go past the sort of sunken ice cream truck, through the dirt, through the dirt pile. I know, yeah, just try and cover your... Obviously we can't close the dump because of course these guys, they don't want to ever close the dump. The dump means too much. The dump's too close to the heart. 
which is also the dump. Because I hate my boss. I'm out here in the literal, the literal field. I mean, this is over 2,200 acres of supernatural and filth. And I'm out here excavating bodies. And, you know, my boss writes the text and pays the bills, but doesn't understand what it's like to telepathically communicate. You need to put any of your personal belongings, any of your treasured bits in the car, that's fine. It's unlocked. There's always someone forcing someone into a different kind of life here. That's the sound of about 600 disgruntled employees that were chased by packs of feral dogs. Like I mentioned, there was, you know, recycling plants are part of the myth. So there's plenty of cans here. It's quite scary around here because the sounds of spirits, their voices are echoed through cans a lot, which amplifies the sound. If you were someone who would go to the mall to go shopping, or you were someone who worked at the mall, that you were often seen running, sprinting from the mall to your car with like this because the smell is so absolutely overwhelming. You could just pass out. And not only that, you would be pronounced dead on sight even if your heart still beat and you'd be taken to this this site, this dump, and you'd just be thrown in with everything else. Kathy O'Leary was a real estate broker who was assigned to this area. She had a really tough time in her life and her career. She dreamed of being a real estate broker as so many, so many women do all her life and she was assigned to this land, this area, the surrounding neighborhoods of this dump. She was quoted to say something like, you couldn't even give away these homes that should give you a sense of what it was like and you can still hear her once in a while kind of in the wind hear her voice saying look at the view about two miles this way it's also said that if you come here around twilight and you kind of look out into the estuary you can still hear her pouring coffee and cutting muffins getting ready for like an afternoon open house but i think she was really proud of that perm so we're gonna give her a bit of a perm here and I, with perms, it's always the bigger the better. So we're really going to add some volume here. It wasn't a feathered perm, it was a curly perm. So we can add some texture, we can add some curl textures as we ex excavate her burial site. So you can see here a head and a big curly perm. And then a very slender figure which she also prided herself for. Legs. Long, skinny legs. She was a former dancer. And then just like delicate little arms. Little arms. Little arms to pour coffee and cut muffins for open houses. They rose from the same land at almost exactly the same time. Legend has it, every time the circle closed in on itself again, the person in the dump would get a little closer to the height of the sky, till you could see the dump from the moon as well as the Great Wall of China. The person always tried to find ways to the sky until it finally took. My dump was the largest in the world from 1955 to 2001, when it closed and the man from 1957 to 2001. Like Jesus, they could both walk on the water of the estuary outlining western Staten Island, water concentrated and condensed so formidably from the factories that line its shore that it turned into corn syrup and solidified just enough to lightly skip over. Being from this place, I'm 70% corn syrup instead of water like other people. A corn syrup trail resembling cheap gravel leads from the beach bungalow of an elderly woman to the beach bungalow of an elderly man, both on a compound a convenient two feet away from each other. Easy for when the woman felt like throwing a broomstick at the man through her kitchen window. They are technically married. In the late 1960s, the younger man who rose from the dump rode himself and his six siblings in a boat down a corn syrup river. After a big, unforgiving storm to a deli and back for supplies. 
If you are departing from Patterson and Hunter at Midland Beach, you can take the bus from St. George Ferry Terminal. Don't be frightened if the bus driver has no head or hands to speak of. Just pay him a gold coin that I will provide for you on this tour, and his spirit will lead you to transfer to the S92 to Victory Boulevard, Glen Street. And then it's just a quick hop, skipping away, 21-minute walk down to the dump. At the dump, the ghosts of feral dogs and vermin will escort you to the eastern edge, down a three-mile greenway. Beautiful views of downtown Manhattan's skyline. If you make it at twilight, you can climb the ghostly heap of forgotten and lost shoes and wallets to the top, and you'll maybe even catch the glimpse of the ghost of a skyscraper, 20 years dead, with a halo of orange and yellow.